It's a great honor for me to be reading an extract from Nadine Gordimer's July's People. At about midday, from the height of the sun and the quiet of the bush, her watch was broken. Maureen Smales, who is alone at the hut, although not alone in the settlement, no one was ever alone there, feels some change in the fabric of subconsciously identified sounds and movements that make the silence. There is a distant chuddering as the air being packed in waves of resistance against its own destiny. Up in the sky, yes. She is sewing the burst seam on one of her son's shorts, good hard-wearing stuff from Woolworths. They were never got up in smart American-style leisure clothes, bought for the sons of wealthy whites, or the bourgeois outfits of miniature gentlemen the poor blacks wasted money on. The sound is not the familiar one of a troop carrier or reconnaissance plane passing. She sticks the needle like a brooch through the pants and stands to gaze. The usual cloud, lying early in wait in the west to bring rain in the afternoon, has drawn a blind over the morning, fuming with suffused sun. The chuddering grows behind it. Her eyes try to follow her ears. A racket of blows that shakes the sky, circles and comes down at her head. The whole village is out now, poised in its occupations, its idleness, cringing beneath the hoverer. There is some sort of cheer, probably from children. A high ringing is produced in her ears. Her body in its ribcage is thudded with deafening vibration, invaded by a force pumping, jigging in its monstrous orgasm. The helicopter has sprung through the hot, brilliant cloud just above them. Its landing gear spread like legs, battling the air with whirling sides. Under its belly, under the beating wings of its noise, she must have screwed up her eyes. She could not see what color it was, what markings it had, whether it held saviors or murderers. July's people run all around her. Above yells, exclamations, discussions, and laughter, she follows the scudding of the engine up there behind cloud. She is following now with a sense made up of all senses. The helicopter lifts once more into the cloud, makes another circle of sound waves out of sight, and then its rutting racket changes level, slows, putters. She did not see it land, but she knows where it is. She knows what it has taken in and in what direction and area the shuddering of the air has died away. She has folded the half-sewn shorts carefully, the habit of respecting the tidiness of cupboards, and hesitating when she enters the hut, places them on the bed. Apparently not satisfied with the shorts appearance, her palm smooths them in a forgotten caress. Then she stands for a moment while fear climbs, hand over hand, to throttle and hold her. She walks out of the hut. The pace quickens, stalks past the stack of thatch and the wattlefowl cage, jolts down the incline, leaps stones, breaks into another rhythm. She is running through the elephant grass, dodging the slaps of branches, stooping through thickets of thorn. She is running to the river. She hears them, the man's voice and the voices of children speaking English somewhere to the left. But she makes straight for the ford, pulling off her shoes, balances as she jumps from boulder to boulder, and where there are no more boulders, does as she has seen done, moves out into the water like some member of a baptismal sect to be born again, and when the water rises to her waist, holds her arms, the shoes in one hand, high for balance, while she pushes with her thighs through the water before them. The water is tepid and smells strongly of earth. It seems tilted, her sense of gravity has wavered. She has righted again, suddenly come through onto the shallows of the other side, and has clambered the cage of roots let down into the mud by a huge fig tree, landmark of the bank that she has never crossed before. Her wet feet work into the shoes as she runs. She runs. She can hear the labored mutter, patter, very clearly in the attentive silence. The bush around and ahead the engine not switched off but idling there. The real fantasies of the bush delude more inventively the romantic forests of Grimm and Disney. The smell of boiled potatoes promises a kitchen, a house just the other side of the next tree. 
There are patches where airy knobthorn trees stand free of undergrowth, and the grass and orderly clumps of barberton daisies belong to the artful nature of a public park. She runs, trusting herself with the suppressed trust of a lifetime, alert, like a solitary animal at the season when animals neither seek a mate nor take care of young, existing only for their lone survival. The enemy of all that would make claims of responsibility, she can still hear the beat beyond those trees and those, and she runs towards it. She runs. <laughs>